something uh, completely different, talking about uh, employees in a workplace uh, during a, a recession and the current crisis. And uh, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Dana Perig from the Bauhifcher School of Psychology. Uh, Dr. Perig is an organizational and occupational psychologist and uh, uh, she heads uh, the, our, M, our joint MBA program, uh, sorry, just joint MA program in organization behavior and development. Dana, please. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here and to take part in this uh, special series for a different perspective for the Corona time. Um, just before I start, I want to make sure that my presentation. Um, you want some slices on yeah. there? Okay. One moment. And I'll need your uh, feedback by nodding or something that we are here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah thank you. Okay. Okay, so again, welcome and good afternoon. Um, I was listening to Doron's lecture and I'm going to take you into a slightly different journey, which is actually a journey about uh, two concepts um, that are very basic in my work, which I'll tell you a few more things about it. But I want to start with Sigmund Freud uh, Sigmund Freud, who was the father of the psychoanalysis, did not pay too much attention to the world of work or to employees at all. This was not his focus. But there was one thing uh, that he was mentioning, and he was saying that if you want very quickly to know if a person, a, a person's well-being or a person's uh, mental functioning, if you want to check it very quickly, then look for love and work. Ask yourself or ask the other person, is this person or am I able to love, to create connection? Am, am I able to work, to execute things? Again, to work could be volunteeringly or for money, but to do things in the world. And these two terms, love and work, has become, a, again, for Freud, it was an indication for functioning and well-being. And for me, these two words are actually the cornerstones of all of the work I'm doing. I'm the head of the MA program, uh, Organization of Behavior and Development, which is being taught in Hebrew and also in English. Actually, it's two programs. And I'm a psychologist of workplaces. I work with people and organizations. And in the deeper level of what I'm doing is actually I'm trying to help people and uh, work environments to create meaningful workplaces. And I think this issue is highly relevant in these days. So we are going, uh, starting with Freud, love and work. I'm going to invite you, and this is very, very personal invitation for our 45 uh, or this hour that we are being spending together to take a look together with me uh, from a theoretical uh, and also organizational perspective on what does it mean in these days, in the 21st century, and especially in the corona time, to be a part of an organization, to love and work, and to be part of a workplace. So these are the questions that we are going to deal with and to relate to. So it's a very personal invitation because I think that every, we are really going through not only an epidemic or not only an economic crisis, I think this uh, situation brings existential questions to the tables, to our personal tables and also to our uh, work tables. And I would like to tackle those issues. Uh, and you are more than welcome to put questions as well as comments and your thoughts in the chat. I'd be happy also to comment to your thoughts, to your uh, reactions, and of course, to your questions. So the main uh, concept that I would like to put in this lecture is caring. And caring is something that we are very well known uh, from our private life, from family, from kindergartens, from schools, from nurturing. 
but this term has been coming in the last 20 years and not only in the corona time is coming into the public sphere and the work sphere and what is interesting about caring and i'm speaking in this lecture only about caring at work is that it's a common sense thing you know when i'm speaking with managers about it they nod and say of course of course caring it's important but unfortunately it's not always common practice and what I was doing in uh, those last weeks during uh, the corona, because I'm interested in this topic, is really also looking what is going on in different companies, in what they do, how they respond to the corona, from the perspective of caring. And what this crisis can reveal to us about the human condition at work and about organizations. So we are here about uh, the concept of caring, from an organizational point of view or caring at the workplaces. And what I'm going to do is really give you some context about the workplaces or world of work uh, in these days, what is actually going on, then bring you a theoretical concept for caring, for caring and then uh, take a look on some practical perspective, how can we promote caring in workplaces, in regular times, and especially uh, in corona or under crisis. Just take, I'm taking a look at you. I, it's important for me to see if the map that I'm putting for you is clear enough for you. So again, please uh, nod with your heads or tell it like this or like this so we can have some physical contact or with your hands. Thank you, Mayan Rosenthal. Uh, Great, this is helpful. Okay, so let's start with the context. You all hear it, and now in the corona, we hear it on a daily basis, but it's, it, it's long before the corona that the world of work is changing and we are entering all the time a new world of work. And I brought you four uh, topics that are very uh, important for understanding the world of work that we, and especially you, uh, uh, Generation Y and Generation Z, are going to enter. And one of the things that is going on in workplaces is because uh, we are all, in the Western world at least, living for more years, it also means that we'll probably need to work for more years. And it also means that in one organization we can find sometimes even four generations of employees baby boomers, generation X, Y, and Z. And this brings a totally different uh, teamwork or atmosphere to the workplaces. So this is one challenge that is going to happen, is happening, it is going to be much more intense in the coming years. The second thing is the dig digitization and automation of processes. And the World Economic Forum every uh, two or three years is bringing out the reports showing what occupations are decreasing or always, almost uh, disappearing, what automation brings in changing occupation, changing the way we work, and what new skills and occupations are rising up. And this again, it's a huge change that is happening all the time, and it really changes not only what does it, where do we work or for whom do we work, it really changes the essence of working is working done in a place, you know, should you, should, do we have to go to a place or can we work from home? Is work something that we do with a machine? Do we have connections with com uh, machines and robots and computers? What about my skills? Am I still relevant? How am I going to upskill or reskill myself? So these questions really change your identity as a worker and for sure, what you're studying in university, in your MBA is highly relevant, but you'll need to keep this lifelong learning, will need to keep going also after your graduation. Disruption is an another important uh, topic, and we are now in the midst of a huge disruption. It started as a health disruption, an epidemic, but of course, as we all can see, it hits all our fields of life. Uh, our family life, our work life, okay, finance, everything. But disruption are not only uh, epidemic, disruption could be huge merger and acquisition. And uh, Phil 
when you are going today to an organization or when you work as a freelance for a company of companies, you are almost constantly being disrupted by huge changes that happen to you. Sometimes they could be predicted. Sometimes they are predicted by management, but you were not told. So for you, it's a totally a disruption as an employee. So we are in an age of a more and more disruptions. And I'll uh, say about it a few uh, more things later. And the fourth uh, topic about understanding the world of work is what is coming from uh, marketing, is what we're calling economy of experience. We are used for many decades to speak about economy of experience regarding products. Okay, when you're selling a soap, so they're trying to sell you not only the soap, but the whole experience and really make you think or feel that soap A is better because the way you B feel or what, what will happen to you when you use this soap. But the same way of thinking is now a, already in some of organization and entering more and more organization thinking about how, what is the employee experience? How employees are going to be more engaged? How do we want to brand ourselves, not only to our clients, but also to our potential workers and also to our current workers that are telling their friends about the experience in this company? So it's not only about the paycheck and the money, but it's really about a totally different thing about economy of experience Actually, it's about what is your identity, what is your story when you are coming to work today. So holding in your mind those um, pillars about thinking about the world of work. The other thing in addition to that is, let's show this, is the concepts which come from sociology, which speaks about liquid modernity. And it's a name of a wonderful book by Zygmunt Baum who is speaking about the way our world, and he also speaks about the world of work, is very liquid. So what was very clear to us yesterday or a year before is not so clear today. Things are changing on a daily basis. And I think that what we are feeling and sensing and seeing in Corona times, which is in a very extreme way, in a different volume happens actually all the time. Of course, depends on your industry. It's not the same to work for a municipality uh, 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 in comparison to working for a startup. But we are in an era of liquid modernity. And liquid modernity means that something happens to our relationships, something happens to our identities, something different happens to the meaning of work and to the work relation that we are creating. And this brings into the stage the concept of caring. And not only caring, but what I'm calling here caring in the times of VUCA. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Those four terms are actually the explanation of what Baum is calling the liquid modernity. VUCA at work means that our work life what we see in organization, how we can, and then how we can navigate our personal career or how we can uh, navigate the whole organization. There is a lot of volatility. Things are much uh, uncertain. Things are very complex. Things are depends on so many factors. And there is a constant ambiguity. It means that in order to develop your career today, if things are so liquid and so ambiguous, it's not that it's ambiguous for one month because you're a new employee and then it becomes very clear. It's constantly ambiguous. There are times it's more ambiguous, like Corona time. It's time it's less, but it's constantly ambiguous. And one of the challenges that uh, organizations are facing is how to deal with this VUCA. Because at the end, you know, we need to be more adaptive and resilient, but at the end, we are human beings and our pace of adaptability and resilience changes from person to person. And I think one of the challenges when we speak about employee engagement is really to ask ourselves, what is our role as colleagues and mainly as leaders and managers in caring in times of VUCA? How do we really create the caring, again, in 
more theoretical perspective, but also in our deeds day to day. I want to put the light on this time of the corona. And I put here, like I said, caring in time, a caring in time of crisis, but don't forget it's not only in time of crisis. But I think the corona time gives us a very special opportunity first to speak about caring. And I'm speaking almost on a daily or weekly basis with people in organizations, employee and managers. And it's very interesting to see that the dictionary of caring has suddenly become highly legitimate. So if before, sometimes manager would tell me, oh, caring, yeah, it's very important, but these are the soft skills, I would always tell the manager, this is your more crucial skills that you need in your organization. And it's not, you know, when you say soft, you downgrade it. And what you can see now, and I'll show you some examples from uh, quotes and things that many CEOs say in these days, is that the language of caring in this crisis has become very legitimate, very upfront and very here. And as I mentioned before, again, it's maybe common sense, but it's not common practice. And this is why I think we should really learn and dig into it. But why is caring so meaning in the time of crisis? One of the things that happens to us in crises from a psychological point of view and I'm a psychologist, so this is the way I'm looking at the world, is that a crisis is really creating a discontinuity. And when, when psychologists try to describe a personal trauma of a person, they're really uh, using this uh, concept of discontinuity, the before and after. How was my life before the trauma? What happens to me after the trauma? But if we're trying to look on this global crisis in, from the glass of discontinuity, what actually happens to us, employers and employees alike, is that we all have discontinuity in the way we think, in the, our logic, things that were clear to us, we don't understand. Should we come to work with masks, without masks? How should we do things? What is allowed? What is not allowed? You know, all this, a lot of information that needs to be, ma be managed. We have a discontinuity in the functioning. How is the supply chain going, going to work? How am I going to, to do my work if I don't have clients or if the clients cannot connect with me? We have discontinuity in connections. You know, we cannot hug our families, but we cannot sit together on a conference with our colleagues. Okay, so we found the solution by Zoom, but what are the pro, what are the cons? And we also have this continuity in our self-regulation. More people feel, you know, some anxiety, distress, even I would say some feelings of grief. You know, they lost, some lost their jobs. And even if you didn't lose your job, but your colleague does, did, it has a meaning. You know, when we come back now to the workplaces, maybe some of us will find only half of their team. So it brings them a lot of discontinuity of the emotion that you use to feel in your team, how you use to work, function, and how you think about what's happening. So the challenge in crisis is really creating continuity in this discontinuity. And this is actually the challenge of the organizations and mainly the leadership. I brought here a quote from uh, Brad Smith in the beginning of the Corona time. It was in the Wall Street Journal in March uh, 14. And he was saying, they were asking him about uh, uh, layoffs. And he was saying, people want to work for an employer that cares about the bottom line and the well-being of its employees. So, Many employee, employers have put now the, what I call the concept of caring in, as part of their agenda, how to deal with the situation, how to treat the workers, how to communicate, what to do. And even, as you'll see at the end of my lecture, even what is the way, which is very hard, to do, to send sometimes people a home if you don't have any other uh, option. I want 
to go back to regular times. This is a part of the Deloitte uh, Human Capital Trends Survey that they conduct every year. And what they found in their uh, survey of uh, 2019, last year, is really what they call the human principles for the organization. They are interviewing and serving hundreds, even thousands of organizations, CEOs and HR. And their conclusion is that we are now in an era, and this is before Corona, that, what, that uh, design principles like purpose, ethics, growth, collaboration and personal relationship, this is the caring, transparency and openness, these are the principles that should lead in the, our era organization. And actually what they speak mainly in collaboration and personal relationship is what I call here caring. And I find this, this report is fascinating because if I start with love and work, I think one of the things that are happening in our days is that we have exchange of languages. The personal language, the personal vocabulary, and look at the words, meaning, growth, passion, collaboration, the, the personal uh, dictionary is entering the business world. And by the way, this is another lecture for another time, but also we see how the business world is entering personal relationship. You know, I sometimes hear couples say things like, oh, this is not what I was thinking. I didn't bargain for this, you know? So you find yourself speaking also in business language in uh, your personal life. But again, this is a, another topic. So the human principles that are the leading principles. And when uh, Brad Smith is saying, this is what's important. This is the places people want to work for. This is exactly part of those principles. And just to show you, um, this is one of the books I was reading uh, for this lecture. Um, I, I'll show you later the book. So on the cover, they were writing, caring is the competitive advantage. So really, the language of caring is entering the language of business. It's here, and I think what this crisis is showing us that it is, I see it, it's much more used and executed during this crisis. And I think maybe this crisis can tell us something about the way we think and the way we manage and the way we lead ourselves in the organization and we develop our career and the way we are leading our teams and the organization as a whole. I want now to add a, a concept that will help us look on caring from a more deeper perspective. And the concept comes for the work of a, a, a psychoanalysis by the name, she's named Jessica Benjamin. She lives nowadays in New York City. And she has a very uh, interesting writing about what is uh, called in psychology, intersubjectivity. I will not go into the whole intersubjectivity, but I want to pick up one very a main concept of Jessica Benjamin's work. And she speaks about mutual recognition. Again, she doesn't speak specifically about organization. I've been doing the adaption to the world of work. Jessica Benjamin says that our challenge in life, our challenge in our development is to know people and to get to be known by others. And relationship in the eyes of Jessica Benjamin and her group, it's not only her perspective, is really about mutual recognition. What we need in our life in order to develop, we need to be able to look with our eyes on the other subject and to know him as a full subject, not only as a, an object that can do a function for us, to do a work for us, to open the door, to bring us money or food, but really as a whole subject and also to be known by the other person. And Jessica Benjamin speaks about the reciprocity, about mutual recognition. She says it's not always equivalent, but it, can, it, goes, it goes both ways. And it could, could go not only by people who are equal, it could go also by a parent and child and also by manager or employer and employee. 
what she's saying, she's saying you have actually two main goals or functions that you need to have in your development. Again, as a person, but also as a worker. It's knowing, again, self-assertion, that's her terms, and recognition. You want, you want to be known, self-assertion, and to, you want to be able to give recognition. And what is interesting, that we are used to think that recognition goes only the way from top to bottom. My manager can recognize and give me recognition for what I've been doing. But the true thing is that the recognition could go for all direction, from top to bottom, from bottom to top, and also uh, uh, by peer or with the equals. What Jessica Benjamin is saying, she says it's, and she's using this metaphor of Escher, the, and I, I'm sure you're familiar with his, uh, uh, with his graphics, because what is interesting about Escher, that for one second or for one moment, we see the birds, the white birds flying to the right, and for one moment, we see the birds, the black birds flying to the left. And you know, he's playing with our, with our eyes, what we can see. And Jessica Benjamin is saying, actually, it's a both end. We should be able to see the white birds and the black birds simultaneously. What she's trying to say, we should be able to have this mutual recognition to see the other and to see ourselves in the same time, or as I said, in a reciprocal process. And if I'm taking her thought, and want to put it in, uh, I think, very, very accurate words from a totally different uh, person. I was uh, picking up a Max Frisch beautiful quote. Uh, he was a Swiss uh, writer and thinker, philosopher, thinker. Uh, and he, was, he said once, we asked for workers, we got people instead. And if we think about deeply, it's really about, we, we are asking, we are hiring people. We want, we, we say, we, I just wanted someone to do the work. I don't want, you know, to get to be too involved, but always we get people instead. And when we are getting people instead, it's about us and it's about them. It's really about a call for this effort for mutual recognition. We have goals. Sometimes we have shared goals as a team or as an organization but we have people there. It's a meeting of a subject with a subject. And Max which is saying it's only an illusion that you can only get workers. You always get people. And this is, again, I'm going back, this is the both end that you need to see, the worker and the person in the same time. So if we are looking at mutual recognition from an organizational point of view, it actually echoes to term that we have in the organizational psychologist vocabulary or literature that speaks about validation, acknowledgement of voice. Voice is the ability or the knowing of every person in the organization that he or she can, are, are being counted, that they can bring their voice that their deeds are being acknowledged, that there is a validation for what I do. It doesn't happen 100% of the time. It doesn't happen, there'll be some disappointment, you know, it always happens. But it's about really being tuned to this place about, so mutual recognition in the context of work is about validating, a, it could be yourself, but it could be validating others, acknowledging what they do, giving voice to people and making sure their voice will be heard. And by the way, those things were very crucial during the corona crisis. Organization who gave voice to people to share their concerns, to give their ideas, to bring, they really did much better than others. So if I'm trying to take this concept of the, the mutual recognition and we ask for workers, but we always get people instead, or first we always get people. How are we going to create it in our organizational life? And for this, I'm bringing you the social architecture framework by Warlein and Dayton, and I'm also added a part of their writing to your reading, so you can go back and see all those 
circles that you see here, all those components in a more detailed way in your reading. And Warland and Dayton, uh, they're writing a lot about caring at work and caring at the workplace and the role of a manager in a caring a culture. So they have a lot of research about it in regular times and also in time of crisis. Some of their work was written after 9-11 and is highly interesting and relevant to our days. But they're putting their models and they're saying, if you want to create a organization with caring, it's not only about goodwill. You really need to be sure that you put the roles, the culture, the network, the story, the leadership, everything in a caring perspective. And I'll give you a few examples of what does it mean from an organizational point of view? How do you create an architecture? How do you build a company, a team that is caring? What do you need to pay attention to? So from an organizational culture point of view, um, and again, I picked the main ideas for those of you who want to go more into details, I added the literature for reading. One aspect is really to put attention and to stress the shared humanity. And in a way, I think that is exactly what happens now in the global crisis. Suddenly, all of us are much more human or much more the same. The, the CEO who sits at the home and his kid is jumping on his laps and disturbing the meeting is dealing with the same challenges or with similar challenges to his employee who is sitting in another country. So shared humanity is really looking for the places, what is also similar about us in the way we deal with things, in the way that we are struggling with, in our challenges, and to use the language of what is the shared part of our existence in this company. The other aspect which is, uh, relates to that is the term of ecosystem versus ecosystem. When you give uh, goals to employees or to teams or to the organization as a whole, look at your goals, look at your agenda and ask yourself, how are these goals are being, what are these goals enforcing? What are these goals facilitating? Are these goals creating or putting more attention of ecosystem, which means what we call in negotiation zero sum game. Your success would be you will be successful or I will be successful if he will not be successful. This is an ecosystem goal. The zoom here is about me, it can be me or my team, and I don't see the other people. Ecosystem goals speaks about inter Again, this independence between or interdependence between the teams, between the people. And we know from this research by Crocker Canevelo that the more people are assigned to ecosystem goals, goals that uh, promote the interdependence, the more they have more caring and the more they can accomplish their goals. Another part for creating this architecture of a caring organization is really in the, is about the way you build the roles, the tasks uh, for the people. We know that in every organization there are what we call role taking and role making. Role taking is the role that you are given, you know, you're having your contract, you're saying this is your role, you're the team leader or you are the programmer in IT. This is your role, these are your duties, this is what you need to do, this is your official uh, contract. It, when we build those roles and we write them or we speak about them when this person enters his job, do we put components of caring in the role? For example, when, if you are uh, in a team, is part of your role to mentor a new employee? is part of your role also to back up a, a person who is missing or is on a maternity or paternity leave. So to what uh, extent does the organization put caring language or caring assignment, let's call it, in the roles? Role making is about the opportunities that we give 
the autonomy or the opportunities we give our employees to really put meaning and to redesign or recreate the role they were given in a way that is meaningful to them. Uh, I will skip now about the multiple stakeholders because I want also to, to have time to speak about leadership and stories. If you want to create a, a, to be part of a caring system, and it's not only for hospitals, you should be sure that there is legitimacy of the caring language. Some organization, you need really to help to break a stigma. And this is an important role of leaders. It's not only for CEO, it's also for team leaders or for mid-management uh, leaders. But of course, if the top leadership gives legitimacy by breaking the stigma, by speaking, caring, by modeling it, it has a huge impact. And again, I'm following what different CEOs are speaking and how they are speaking about the crisis. I think what is interesting and listen to the talks and listen to what is, uh, people are uh, doing and describing is that the language in this crisis, the language of caring has become upfront. And I give you one example and then we go, I come back to that. And this is an example from this week. Unfortunately, uh, Airbnb is about to fire to send home 25% of uh, their employees. It's huge. And Brian Chesky, co-founder and CEO of Airbnb, wrote this week on May 5th a letter. Personally, I have to tell you, it's a long letter. I read it five times. And those are, I'm sure you can find it uh, online. I brought you only a few quotes. It's important for me to say that those quotes I picked up, it's after a long letter that described the deeds, how they are going to support. First, why is, he, why is the situation like this that he has to send people home? What are going to be very transparent? What are going to be the criteria for sending people home? Criteria about diversity, criteria about many criteria. Then what are they going to give and support to the people? Money, help with finding careers, take your laptop home, you know, from very... And then he's saying, and I, again, it's a very long letter, but only after when he's showing all his plan, then he's using, and I'm quoting a few things, the world needs human connection now more than ever. And I know that Airbnb will rise to the occasion. Okay, I believe in this because I believe in you. I have deep feeling of love for all of you. Okay, our mission, and then he connects it to the mission of Airbnb, travel like a human. The human part was always important than the travel part. What we are is about belonging and at the center of belonging is love. I'm using it as an example of what does it mean to use the language of caring. And the language of caring should always come with the right deeds. And again, it's important because the quote I showed you is after a long detailed things, what is going to happen, a lot of clarity, transparency about all the criteria and what people are going to receive to have like a safety net for their next step. But the more managers, and not only managers, I think it's also every person, how we treat each other, how we model it, how we can go out of the closet and use the caring language in the midst of the business. Do good business, stock market, startups, healthcare, whatever, but use this framework and give stories and language that echoes to caring. I think that the caring is really the basis for growth, personal growth, career development for a person as a, as a talent, but also the growth of companies. So I think what I'm wishing for all of you who are here in the lecture and also for the different organizations and companies because we are all now struggling is really to come out of this uh, crisis in, with care and with growth to better times. And I'll end with a quote from a psychologist who was saying, again, back to recognition and care, 
Recognition between people means that care is the psychological equivalent to our need to breathe unpolluted air. And all of us are breathing, but we all know the difference. When are we breathing unpolluted air? And when are we breathing polluted air? So thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Uh, let's open it up uh, for questions. I think uh, you're not uh, have a question. Yeah, I'll begin. Maybe it will uh, stimulate others. So uh, thank you. That was fascinating, Dana. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts in the regards of gender. So thinking of that Airbnb uh, note, so I don't remember the name, but I'm guessing it was a, a male uh, and not a female, because I'm thinking if a female would um, be so caring in her message, it would be perceived more negatively than if it's a male. So in, when you're, you're saying that, and I agree that, that the takeaway is like be more caring, I'm curious about gender differences in this regard. Okay. Uh, Neon, do you want me to respond each question or to collect? I think to okay. respond. Okay, thank you, Yonat. Uh, you hit a, a hot bottom. I'm, uh, the um, issue of gender is highly important here. When people, je uh, let's say, let's put it like this. Caring is usually associated with gender or with women. And when women, what is interesting is when women, and we know it uh, from, we, sh we see it also in research, when women are, uh, women in leadership position are showing or speaking or showing, let's say, caring behaviors, it sometimes they get a backlash. Exactly. Okay? Sometimes they pay a price for it. We can even and see it in the Israeli leadership of the uh, Sadetsky versus um, the CEO of the um, municipality. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when women, uh, uh, when women show caring behaviors, or even let's, it's sometimes very delicate. Women uh, in leadership position are really caught up sometimes in a limbo between I have the ability to care. I think it's important to care. I want to do even more caring after hearing this lecture, but I'm afraid I'm going to pay a price for it. And the price would be starting from the language and saying, oh, here are those soft skills. Here is this motherhood language. And I think, again, I think women are in a very delicate situation. I'm speaking here to the audience. I see here women and men, and I'm speaking to you all both because I want you to notice that and be aware, again, even to your own reaction when you see it coming from a woman, a woman or a man. But still, I think it's a challenge for us to connect and Brian Chesky in his letter is doing it beautifully, how it connects the caring language to the business agenda, what Airbnb stands for, how he builds uh, his plan for the next steps. And... You know, I know, I know this dilemma for many women, again, in consultancy and also from research, and I think we should be bold and keep on, okay? People say they have more questions, so uh, David had a question. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask, actually. Can you please open the camera, David? Is. Oh, no, can you hear me now? Yeah. I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Yeah, I, I have to apologize. I don't have a camera on this computer. Okay. So uh, my question was about the, the other side. I, I bumped uh, and I cannot forget it since then. I bumped into a business that was very egoistic. The, the, the owner was probably like very traumatic. He was really uh, on the edge of abusing his uh, workers. No care was really everything about the, the money. And then I was very much surprised to see that he, they were established in the early 80s. And uh, they are still successful, profitable, uh, changing worker really fast. But work for them seems, seems to be quite well. So have you, do you have any uh, good insight or understanding 
what's the situation or how can a business actually survive and do so well when the behavior is exactly the opposite of what uh, I, I think and you have presented as optimal? I want to check if I, if I heard you and understood you well, okay, David? Mm -hmm. Are you asking me, is it possible that um, um, uncaring businesses would be very, very profitable? Very successful. Uh, yeah, very successful. Now, is this yeah. your question? Yeah, and okay. And if you okay. have any insight about this, how, how come it's still working even okay. though something very basic is wrong? Okay. So, you know, it would be a very ideal world to say that, um, you know, caring organizations are doing top in profits and the uncaring ones are, uh, you know, declining. Um, it doesn't work like this. And I think it's something about really also about thinking um, in a way, and I think in a way, and this is my opinion, I think it's a way, it's a question about ethics and about in what kind of world or society do you want to live? As a person, and doesn't mean if you're a person, you're a CEO and you're an employee, what kind of life, what kind of society and what kind of organization do we want to live in? So profit is highly important and revenues are important. Everything is important, but how do we want to get there? And what are the prices that we are willing to pay? And what are the prices we are unwilling to pay? And could there be a, other options to do things also profitable and also in the right and caring way that takes more values into consideration? What I call in the ecosystem thinking, which is not thinking only on my current short-term revenues and profits, which is very important, but also in a more long-term sustainable, I think it's a way, it's like, in the, it's like thinking sustainability from a psychological point of view. Okay. But again, still you're right. There are, there are places I would not want to work there and they are not rated in the best places to work in, but they might be very good in profit. Just a short notice about this. Yesterday, BDI published the list of the best places to work in in Israel. And it's interesting. So there's a list there of different companies. Some, uh, um, for some, they are, you know, upgraded in the list. Some went down. And there is now a discussion because the data was collected in January and then they analyzed it. And now, so it doesn't have to do anything with Corona time. But now when they have this ranking, they are now checking what are those companies doing or not doing in Corona times. And one of the things that I've read, again, I didn't check it personally, but what I've read is that the, the 21st rated companies, best places to work at in, in Israel, none of them, for example, send home employees now in the Corona times. And some of them are, they are not public sector, they're businesses, for-profit organization. So again, it's interesting to, to look at it. More. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. David and thanks, Dana. Uh, Lior had a question. Um, yes. So I have two points uh, I would like you to elaborate on. First is um, this situation is uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in the business uh, surrounding, in the personal surrounding, like every dimension, uh, the ground is shaking. And how do you think this uh, uncertainty also in the business, how could a management could um, uh, use the language of caring when they are as well under these uh, circum circumstance? And uh, the additional point is regarding sarcasm and layoffs. Mm. One part of uh, one type of strategy that companies are engaging is laying off or taking to uh, on uh, leaves. And even when uh, using the language of caring, such as the CEO of Airbnb used, could it, could it uh, raise sarcasm and actually hostility from the employer? Employee, sorry. 
I think, yeah, thank you, uh, Leo. I think I just want to add that Juliana asked a similar question here. Uh, how can a com company transmit uh, caring where the government, government is changing regulations so fast? So I think okay. it, 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 Thank you. So thank you, Juliana and Leo. Um, okay. I think um, using the language, again, it's not only about language. When I say language, I mean it's words, but also deeds. Using the language of caring can only work if it is authentic. The moment employees or shareholders or whoever, let's, call, let's speak about employees, the moment employees recognize that it's not authentic, it's not, your deeds are not aligned with what you say, you know, there are big discrepancies, it would not work. So you can, let's say, you can bluff or lie or go around a little bit, but not too much. So it needs to be really authentic, true and consistent. The, I think what it means, I go to Juliana and then back to Lior, I think what it means when we speak about caring, caring is exactly what we need when the, when the, when the floor is uh, rocking, when it is unstable. That is exactly the time when we need this caring. And the meaning of caring is not that my CEO can tell me something that the government doesn't know. Sandem is really saying tra very transparently and very clear, we do not know when are we going to be back at, uh, to work. Okay, the moment I will know, I let you know. But what I do know at this moment is A, B, and C. Okay, in these parts, I'm dependent on health regulation on the government or whatever. Okay, but in other parts, I can still look for what people need because now when you're working from home and actually you are not working from home, all of us are working with home. It's, a, it's not remote work, it's totally different things. We are working with home, okay? So all our existence is that all our identities are on the, with the same screen on the same chair. I'm sitting in this chair, I'm a spouse, I'm a mother, I'm a lecturer, I'm a psychologist. It all happens here at the same time. This is a totally different challenge. So even if the organization is, the situation is changing because it is changing. It's sometimes even telling people it is what it is. You know, we are really playing it by ear and every moment or every, sometimes it's every hour, sometimes it's every two days. We need to understand what the situation means to our business, to analyze it and to let you know what happens. And what is important, and I'm going back to Lior to your first questions about how does it look like caring in this unstable time. So one thing is really a transparency about what we know and what we do not know. The second thing is really being very close and in a lot of communication and contact. It could be in email, in Zoom groups, in WhatsApp, whatever works for your organization. A lot of communication, a lot of presence. You need to remember when you are going every day to a workplace, people are walking. You see people, there is presence of people. In order to have a presence of your, again, colleagues, a team leader, CEO, this is the way, how do you create presence? How do you create caring presence? It's really about checking what do people need in order to do the work? Because again, it's not they work from home, they work with home. So what do you really need? Okay, so it's really about uh, on checking in, sensing what is needed, and all the time communicating where do we stand, what do we know at the moment, what do we don't know at the moment. And uh, I see that uh, Sam had a question. Uh, sorry, Sandra before that. Yes, yes. Um, I want to relate to what Lior said before and uh, continue it because uh, I think she, um, what she meant and, and the answers you gave are for um, how to manage workers while the crisis inside the workplace or at home. But when we do have to let people go and we are sending them off, how much care will take, I mean, 
the person is, is being, uh, um, you're taking the bread out of his children. How much the fact that you're a very nice, caring person will uh, help him in that situation? Because in that moment, for him, it's the end of the world. So, so how much care will take us? How far will it take us? Okay. You know, to send people home, um, I call it the execution dilemma, okay? And I'm saying it because I did it, not now, but I, I had to do it and not in, ma in mass, but for a person. So I, I was in situation as a, as a leader, as a manager, I needed to, to take this uh, hard decision. And I remember myself um, not sleeping, you know, making decision, not sleeping and so on. And I remember saying, and what I said to myself is so, it's the same I'm saying to other managers, it's very good that you do not sleep. It's very good that you suffer. It doesn't mean your, your decision is not right. Sometimes you need to send people home. Sometimes it's a specific person because it doesn't fit, but let's speak about Corona, okay? You know, business change. And again, I'm encouraging you to read uh, Airbnb CEO's letter because you'll see there the rationale. So is it easy? No. This person, I think the question of caring is one about what can I give really tangible things Okay, tangible. It can be the laptop, take it home. It could be a, a more money. It could be a leaf. That we, so what can I give? It could be sending him, pay for him to go to a, a counselor, career counselor, etc. There are many options. What can you do? But one is, what do you give this person, you know, when he's uh, leaving? What is the message that you are, uh, you're giving him? And again, is it, it's still said when you're doing it in a caring way, but I think it's, it really makes a difference. It really makes a difference to know as an employee that I was sent home, not because of my talent, but because of a situation, that I'm being appreciated, but it came to a point that, you know, thousand people go home, I'm part of them because of these transparent criteria. It's that, Again, it doesn't change my situation, but it's good to know that the company supports me. I'm being acknowledged for what I did. So I'm not trying to say sending home people is something to celebrate, no. And I was working with people who were sent home. I was working in my lab with managers who sent people home. And you won't believe it, but they are both suffering. But I think doing it with care and with intention and attention it makes a difference. It makes a difference for the person who's being sent home, and it makes a big difference for those who stay in the company. Don't forget, the day after you're coming back to the organization and you have there your employees, minus, let's say, 100, minus those, the other friends who are not there. So the way you handled it, it will be part of the culture in your organization. So you need to put a lot of thought and sensitivity to this. Thank Let's you. have one uh, final question by Sam and then conclude. Sam? Okay, hi there. Um, hi. If I understood you correctly, you've been... I can't hear you. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Okay, if I, if I understood correctly, this is, um, it's not a brand new concept, but it's a concept of this century. Um, and I was wondering why, why this century? What, what changed since uh, 1999? It's what the concept of? You, you were saying that this is a kind of 21st century concept. Um, so what changed this century that this has become important? Mm. I just want to be accurate. I think what is, what is changing is that this, the language, the concept, which is Again, we are all familiar with it in our private life, and most of the people appreciate it in their private life. I think it's entering the, you know, more the work life, the business life. And I think what, again, it's, it's an opinion, what, what I see and what I read is happening, is really, you know, when you're saying uh, in motivation theories today, when you're speaking with people about meaningful work, 
growth, lifelong learning, come to work with us and you'll get the opportunities to upskill, reskill, learn. And you know, this is today the language of hiring. It's not only about the paycheck. If this is the language, then I think it, caring is only, almost something natural that should go in, in part of it, okay? So people say, you know, it's all about, you know, people. You, at the end, you work with people, for people, your clients are people. I think that it's, what's, it's, it's about really the human connection. And that's what you hear from people. There is this uh, nice quote, people say, I, I, you come to a work, but you leave your boss. You know, that's when you are. Uh, so uh, it has a lot of meaning. And don't forget that we spend a lot of our daytime, okay? A huge percentage of our awaking hours are at work, even if not physically at work, but with work, at work, for work, okay? All those, co and I think part of what work is, Fun, is psychological function for us is also for human connection. I am used, used to say that uh, work, workplaces are in a way like the kindergarten of the adults. And think about it, competition, jealousy, caring, learning. So that's the kindergarten of the adults. That's what we are going every morning or participating every morning. And also our, when we, you say bring your whole self to work, bring your talent, bring your innovation, bring your creativity. How can I bring my whole essence, my really inner assets, my innovation, my creativity, my passion, my energy, if I don't get the, the let's say, the um, suitable fuel for that? Thank you very much, Dana. It has been fascinating. Uh, thanks, thanks for the time and thanks everyone for the questions. I think Yonat has a few uh, final wor words. Yeah, thank you so much, Dana. Um, You're welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Oded will send everyone later today the assignment for next week. And also I just uh, posted on the chat uh,